book by Howard Becker, some of you will be familiar with it. It's, it's uh, quite an old book called Tricks of the Trade. Um, and Becker finishes uh, his book by uh, talking about what it means to have gotten a social science way of thinking into your bones. He uh, talks about uh, being a rather annoying uh, person in that he's always challenging uh, what people say. He um, uh, asks them, uh, you know, the basis for uh, what they're saying and so on. And uh, it's just part of his life to do that. And uh, so he talks about the forces of habit. He gives another example that makes it very clear, um, talking about swimmers who swim competitively who need to uh, touch the end of a pool with two hands, um, which is not something that one might do naturally. And in order to, to be competitive, the swimmers who are competitive, sorry, are those who, even when they're just swimming in a relaxed way for leisure, will still touch the end of the pool with both hands. So that it becomes such a force of habit that when they're competing, they don't have to think about doing it. So he talks about this as um, having a habit in his life of um, thinking as a social scientist. And I'm going to talk about having a habit of thinking as a mixed methodologist. He, uh, he tells a Zen story about a dragon gate. And if I can just uh, quickly um, give a, a version of this story. He talks about um, in the middle of the ocean there being a, a place, a gate, where if a fish swims through it, it becomes a dragon. The problem is trying to find where this gate is. So you might look for, um, you can't see the gate, and you might look for the fish that's changed into a dragon. But unfortunately, the fish doesn't actually change its appearance. And in fact, it doesn't even change its way of thinking or feeling. It doesn't actually feel any different either. But it has become a dragon. It's gone through the gate. And this is the, uh, the, the gate that we need to go through in terms of becoming mixed methods um, methodologists. So, or developing a mixed methods way of thinking. I'm going to suggest that um, we start with a mixed methods way of thinking about everyday things. If you're buying a house, you you look at the you look at the um, distances, you look at the sizes, you look at um, you know, various kinds of measurements. You also assess how it feels, how it looks, and so on. So that anything that we look at, anything that we consider, any phenomenon naturally has both qualities and quantities attached to it. And so we need to think about both sides of things, that both those kinds of aspects. When I first started, well, in my earlier days of research, in my early days of researching, and I think right back to some undergraduate projects where um, I used uh, measurements and uh, qualitative ways of thinking. And if I go to my um, PhD project, which was uh, a very long time ago, um, and I looked at what I'd done, uh, looked at the, uh, the, the write-up when I was preparing uh, for this talk, and what I found was that um, well, I knew I'd taken a mixed methods way of, of dealing with a community study. I was quite surprised when I looked at the way I'd actually written it up. I'd written it up the way I think that mixed methods should be written up, and we'll talk more about that um, in a while. But I, the kind of thing I did was to, um, I needed to do a com look at community needs in a, in a um, what was a community of public housing uh, apartments in uh, western suburbs of Sydney. And so I spent um, over six months as a, well, in fact, I stayed doing this for much longer, but formerly a participant observation period of a period where I was just observing for six months. Um, I developed a survey 
I um, explored uh, social indicator data, the, um, the, the usage of, of welfare services, um, the uh, instances of um, where, <coughs> where uh, families or children had come to the attention of um, health department or um, welfare department um, authorities and so on. I looked at even things like school attendances and library usage and you know, a whole range of things and put all of this data together into a write-up about the community needs and an analysis of what the needs were of that community and the resources. The thing is that back then I'd never heard of mixed methods. I just did it. Um, I was basing what I did on the uh, work of the early Chicago sociologists and and um, and also some British um, sociologists. Uh, so um, I had some some guides as to you know the kinds of things one might do. But the term mixed methods, this is back in the 70s, early 70s um, in Australia anyway, wasn't um, wasn't in use. So I was doing mixed methods and thinking as a mixed methodologist um, without uh, it being a formalised approach. So let's apply this thinking a bit in, in, um, in trials because um, I'm talking with a trial centre so this is appropriate. Um, so, um, typically we think about trial methodologies and I'm speaking here not just of say medical drug trials but broader health service trials or, um, and so on, things like that, but we typically think of measuring quantitative outcomes and looking at the process in a qualitative way. But I'm going to argue that you should think about both the process and the outcomes in the mixed methods way. When you're thinking about what you want to find out, what you want to achieve with the trial, think about what can you find out about that without restricting it to being quantitative or without necessarily quantifying everything. And the same with the process, there will be um, a lot of qualitative information but there will also be some interim quantitative information, things like attendances or something like that. There'll be, there'll be things that you can um, identify, that you can measure on the way through as well as at the end. So it's just a different way of thinking, that you're thinking about methods of obtaining information without necessarily classifying them as quantitative or qualitative. Uh, doing so, of course, I've just got to note their benefits from a coordinated team um, with someone who acts as either a member or leader or advocate who is familiar with uh, methods of quantitative and qualitative methods. So what's happened then is people were thinking that way and Jennifer Green and um, uh, Gretchen Reisman and um, I can't remember her name, Rallis, Reisman and Rallis and people like that talk about evaluation researchers having always thought that way of, of thinking about methods not divided into quant and qual um, but just thinking about what kind of information they can get. <clears throat> what happened then was um, with the, uh, the paradigm debates were a, a major um, prompt for the change, but essentially what happened as qualitative methods first and then mixed methods became more formalised, became um, defined as approaches to social science rather than just something that one did naturally. Um, terminology was developed and definitions and rules 
uh, kind of were developed. People started developing typologies, they started developing definitions, they started developing um, you know, rules, basically. And the terms qualitative and quantitative um, became um, uh, emphasized and also differentiated in a whole range of ways, which we'll look at in a moment. Um, Max Bergman has written a, a really wonderful little uh, little chapter in a book that he published in about 2008, I think it was, um, about how the terms qualitative and quantitative are straw men terms. They, they actually don't have a lot of substance to them. And uh, I'll explain that perhaps. I'm going to actually jump two slides here and come back to that one. Um, and so what he, he argues and what others have argued as well um, is that the terms kind of show a broad differentiation, but uh, in fact, the way that people, people used to um, list, in, you know, you'd get it in textbooks, you probably still do, uh, lists in textbooks of how quantitative research differs from qualitative, and I've listed some of those ways uh, on the screen here. And uh, so people would try to differentiate the two. Uh, and what, what I and many others, including Bergman and others, argue is that these ways of differentiating are not that clear. The differences are in fact very fuzzy. Um, so if it was typically thought that you'd use qualitative methods, for example, for exploratory research and, and quantitative methods for deductive or confirmatory research. But it's quite possible to do that the other way around and to, to do exploratory work with quantitative methods or to do confirmatory work with qualitative methods. Um, it's possible to have a very controlled qualitative study. It's possible to have uh, a quite open, as I said, exploratory quantitative study um, and so on. So the various things, any particular study will, will vary uh, on each of these dimensions. And there, it, when I went through all of the um, differentiations that people had made, I think I came up with about 40 different ways that people had tried to distinguish quantitative from qualitative methods. If you take any particular study, you'll find that in some ways it's more at the qualitative end and in other ways it'll be more at the quantitative end, even if it is defined as a qualitative or quantitative study. And so what um, Bergman <coughs> and others are saying uh, is that you can't clearly distinguish it. We've got a sense that this is more at the qualitative end, this is more at the quantitative end. And so what he has suggested is a better way of thinking about it, is to think about these as two families of methods which overlap. And the distinction, it's not always possible to tell exactly which family some aspects are in. Okay, so where does this take us? So it takes us to um, a mixed methods way of thinking about and doing research. It takes us to a, a place where we don't necessarily think in terms of qualitative and quantitative, but we think in terms just of methods. So um, it, this means that we'll engage with multiple perspectives. It means that we'll focus on our research purposes and questions rather than uh, satisfying a, it has to be have a quant plus a qual method. Um, it will impact on the way we design. It will impact on the kind of data, the way we judge the relevance of data. 
impact on the uh, methods used and on how we write the results. And I'm going to look at these things. So first of all, we're going to engage with multiple perspectives. We might look at things um, inductively, deductively, uh, quantitatively, qualitatively, uh, holistically um, or not. We might uh, look at something in a macro way or a micro way. Uh, basically, we're going to look at things in multiple different ways. Um, we're going to uh, focus on our research purposes and questions. Uh, I, lo I love this uh, little bit from Einstein where he says, if I had an hour to solve a problem and my life depended on it, I would use the first 55 minutes to determine the proper questions to ask. So from the questions, and informed potentially by a conceptual framework or theory, we develop a program theory or um, we can um, or adopt a program theory to provide a co coordinated framework for our study. This may be more or less complicated, but the questions will be modified by the framework to some extent, they will be informed by the framework and they will inform it. So it's a two-way um, process. So the example I have here is just uh, of a study that's looking at trying to understand the pathways into a research career. And so it is informed by the idea that uh, research development is a combination of both personality factors and the environment. It's not a very um, um, complex kind of um, um, framework, but you know, basically uh, there. And, and so what I've done here is mapped out the various elements that uh, are potentially having an influence. Doing this kind of conceptual mapping helps to break down the question into component parts so that you can then uh, identify more easily what kind of information you need. And so, for example, in this question, I've looked at a number of things that create initial motivation. Part of my um, theoretical or, or framework insight as I was thinking through this was that um, there are still other things that are needed before you actually engage in research. And these are um, some personality characteristics about persistence and commitment and agency, but also some environmental characteristics like a supportive management, time, resources, opportunity, and so on. Mentoring is important. Um, having a mentor that inspires you or a mentor that can see that you have research capacity even if you don't hadn't thought about it yourself. Uh, and so you engage and so on. And so spelling this out helps to, as I said, break the question down into elements that then make it uh, more possible to see what kind of data you're likely to need to design your study more thoroughly. Now, um, this is obviously not a, um, a trial type study, um, it's uh, an exploratory study. Um, it could potentially lead to a trial type study, I guess, uh, although I'm not sure that one would run a trial on trying to create researchers, but anyway. Um, yeah, so having done that, one then thinks about what kind of, of data one might need. And actually, I'm going to skip forward again to the next slide. No, I won't. I'll go back. Sorry. Um, so you've worked out what you need to know. 
uh, the kinds of things you need to know. You have to then take into account um, the, uh, the demands and the opportunities of the situation. So your methods, you may have some ideal ideas about what methods would answer a particular question, but uh, the situation is likely to, um, to create some limitations. There might be gatekeepers, there may be ethical issues, particularly with trials. Um, uh, there will be ethical issues to deal with. Uh, the research may need funding or you might have to be very inventive about how to, uh, to obtain data without funding. Um, there are questions of um, setting priority of what comes first. Uh, and all of this is in the context of what your overall purpose is. Now, I'm suggesting that the mixed methods um, thinker will not judge data by its form, but by its relevance. You know, is this data going to help me answer my question? So it's totally around um, what data can I obtain that will help me to answer the questions or to get information about the various elements I need in order to answer the questions. So think beyond, um, for instance, having to do a survey plus a um, interviews, which is the most common form of a mixed method study. I think about 56% um, of studies are in that form. You might, that may be what you need. And in fact, um, I'm doing uh, some research now where those are in fact the two major methods. But that's not necessarily um, going to be the case and, and you should not be limited to that. And so in this one, I'm also collecting some um, uh, uh, sorry, name's gone off my head. Um, uh, yeah, to, to go um, to go beyond just thinking about uh, surveys and, and interviews, think about documentary sources, secondary data sources, maybe social media sources, social network sources. Um, look at the, the, the networks that are involved, particularly you know with researchers. One of the things I've looked at is uh, in looking at researchers is looking at the networks that they are part of and how that influences uh, the, the, uh, the, their productivity. Um, there may be administrative data that you can check. There uh, um, may be existing literature that you can synthesize. There may be pictorial data. So think about data in terms of its relevance rather than its form. So if I go back to my um, conceptual model here of um, pathway to becoming a researcher and just play with some ideas about methods, um, you can see that there are a whole range of overlapping methods that I might use in order to, to build a picture overall of the pathway to becoming a researcher. In fact, um, a lot of this is based on a study that uh, I and some colleagues did uh, quite a long time ago about, uh, about exactly that, or about at least becoming an early career researcher and developing from there. And so uh, I've suggested that there may be some survey data to start with, some retrospective cross-sectional data. Uh, there may be, uh, maybe there'll be a longitudinal cohort that can be followed. And there you might think about, do you use um, uh, some repeated qualitative interviews or some other form of um, uh, journal or whatever type data? Or do you use um, uh, some uh, quantitative data and do event history analysis? Do you, uh, you could use um, uh, the publication records over time to see the development of a, 
something about the development of researcher, their their uh, career path in terms of grants and uh, um, or research projects they've been involved in, and their career path through a university. If we're talking about academic researchers. There are um, you might choose some case studies to follow through. You might look at the networks that people are involved in and what influence those have had. How important are collegial networks in the, in the development of a career researcher, uh, and so on. So um, there's a whole range of methods. Things to keep in mind about the methods are that they need to be addressing uh, the same general question, same purpose. That's a fairly obvious thing, and. Ideally, they need to have some commonality in the sample. And in fact, the closer the, the commonality, the easier it is to combine the data from different methods. And so uh, you may have a parallel sample, um, which is you know, two, two different samples that are actually um, have uh, some degree of commonality. So I might have. Uh, some data collected on one set of researchers and other data collected on another. It's much better if I can have different kinds of data collected from the same uh, the same sample, or um, perhaps one is embedded within the other, or perhaps um, they're just uh, two sets of data of equal status with the uh, with the same uh, sample. That gives the opportunity of linking the data. More thoroughly. And so, what you're trying to seek uh, through this is an analytic integration of the methods used. And I'm suggesting that this happens through um, iterative exchange, typically throughout a study. Um, now, there is would be some exceptions to this where uh, the again thinking in terms of trials. Uh, where some parts of um, the data have to be kept separate from the other. Uh, and the example I'm thinking of is a colleague of mine who was running a, um, it's basically a repeat or confirmatory kind of a trial, and um, to look at the translation from an original RCT into a um, more extensive study. And so, she, as the developer of the program and having run the original trial, set up the, um, the guidelines for implementation of the trial, for implementation of the program that was being trialled. But an independent group was setting up the measures of the outcomes. So the person who was implementing was keeping process data and another group that were quite separate until the trial was completed were gathering the outcome data. Now that's a fairly unusual situation, but even within those, some of the outcome data is qualitative as well as quantitative, some of the process data is quantitative as well as qualitative. and so. There is a potential, even in that situation, but certainly in most projects, for what we'd call iterative exchange on the way through. And it may even be that um, the methodology, uh, in fact, the, the way that a trial or the way something is being run might need to change because interim data is suggesting that something's not working. or um, other kinds of exchange are, are when um, insights from one method suggest new ways of gathering data um, using a different method that will add to the overall picture to be obtained. And so there will be um, methods integration on the way through. Now I'll talk a, bit, a little bit more about integration of the methods. And so how talk about how this is done um, to some extent. And so uh, we can talk about combining methods, 
and uh, so a very simple example, a uh, simple um, illustration here is where you've got uh, both uh, numeric and text data, or you've got you know, different kinds of data. It may be geographic data, or it may be um, you know, whatever kind of data, uh, visual or whatever. Um, that you'll start to um, basically you need to use a coding or sorting system so that you can um, sort out the bits of information you have regardless of source about the particular topic or issue or sub subtopic. Um, you know, one of those um, points back on your conceptual map you have some information about so you gather it from all the different sources. I suggest um, doing that using either qualitative software or um, using uh, even just using Word um, and using headings uh, so that you can gather your bits of information. You combine them. That allows you to um, compare and to, to see what the different methods are saying. Does it come together? Is there is there a different? Are they in fact contrasting? Do they give you different pictures? And that sends you off to um, investigate further. Uh, so you're going to combine data. You're going to compare it. You're going to contrast it. You may use groups defined by um, by perhaps survey questions or demographics, or a, a point on a scale, and use that to to run comparisons on how people talk about something. So there are all different kinds of, of ways of combining and comparing and contrasting the different sources of data that will then lead to you um, describing, um, interrelating those different sources of data uh, to uh, develop a comprehensive picture or maybe to uh, inform further research uh, or to, um, to identify um, relationships between um, different things. You may um, end up needing to uh, transform some data to consolidate it into a common database uh, and that uh, is a, is a, um, um, that will then help you to, um, to see some patterns uh, in the data. So um, when I'm talking about a consolidated database, for example, using something like Excel or again using qualitative software where you're bringing the different kinds of data together, uh, if necessary, transforming some of it. Uh, into a form that allows you to do this, that then allows you to do further further analysis on that data. So using um, multiple different methods, some of them um, statistical, some of them uh, qualitative, some of them that are hard to define as one or the other. So um, some of the exploratory statistical techniques that are actually more qualitative than quantitative. And through this, you seek patterns and you explain. I was just thinking that there is something else I actually meant to say earlier on too. Um, thinking about, um, to, to give you an, another example of thinking and challenging the way we normally conceptualize data. If you think about survey data, um, and think about the questions and people tick a box or um, circle a number to answer their question. If you, that's typically described as a quantitative method. But if you think about how that survey question was designed and then about how the person who's answering it interprets it in order to write their answer, then you start to see it as not quite so quantitative. That the person answer each each stage involves interpretation. And then, um, if it's scale type data, uh, as an analyst, you may um, amalgamate these and and run a factor analysis. 
and you're going to interpret the dimensions that come out of that factor analysis. So again, there's interpretation. And so I uh, tend to describe um, surveys as either qualitative or as, as a hybrid. I think I'd use the word hybrid these days, as a hybrid method. Um, something that involves um, both qualitative and quantitative thinking. In fact, um, there's a, a new book out by a, a guy called Robert Schroff, a professor in linguistics from the US. And he talks about um, both text and numbers being a form of discourse and treating all of them as discourse. And in fact, when he treats survey data, he's reading it as discourse, but he's also um, he's also analysing one of his suggestions for analysing survey data is rather than analysing by the question the way we normally would, getting frequencies or whatever for each question, he is suggesting that you analyse the patterns for people. And so, for example, you can do a cluster analysis of responses, uh, a cluster analysis of the um, respondents, the participants who answered the survey questions based on their pattern of responses. And so identify groups of participants and then look at the patterns of their responses and how they differ. So it's a different way of thinking about surveys and thinking about survey analysis. It basically boils down to seeing all data as having a qualitative foundation and as being interpretive in some way. So what we're doing when we're putting things together is we're looking for patterns, we're looking for explanations. And I will talk a little bit more about explanations in a moment. Before I do, um, I just want to push the idea that um, computer technology is uh, pretty much essential, in my way of thinking, for most mixed method studies. I won't say all, I'm not going to be that dogmatic, but um, you will benefit hugely from the integrative use of computer technology and especially um, from the more recent uh, versions of qualitative software. Um, most qualitative programs are rapidly becoming mixed methods programs um, these days. And so um, they allow you to bring together different kinds of data. Um, they will generate results. Uh, what's showing on the screen there is a comparison just based on gender, um, where it shows you um, how many people talk about um, talking about research in different ways and different kinds of emotions, and, and whether males or females express uh, more or less of different kinds of emotions, um, and then. Uh, by uh, clicking on one of the cells in that table, you can actually uh, obtain the actual text that supports the numbers. And so you're getting uh, both how, how many and in what way. Uh, so you're getting both um, uh, numeric and text data and two ways of looking at the same, the same issues. Uh, the, um, uh, example down the bottom is showing um, where it says case 1, case 10, case 100 and so on. That's from a study where the data were um, coded qualitatively but then converted into um, a quantitative data set to be analysed statistically. Uh, the uh, um, little uh, cluster diagram at the bottom it was actually generated in a qualitative program or it could have been generated uh, from a statistical program based on the transformed data. So it's generated from qualitative data but looks at um, clustering uh, based on commonality in, in the case of the diagram on the, on the screen there. 
uh, the clusters are based on commonality of words used uh, when talking about those different topics. What this does is just give you um, some more insights. The whole point about all of this is just to give you a bit more information, a bit more insight into what's going on. Um, the thing then is to keep asking questions. Um, a bit like um, Becker and his sociology, um, social science way of thinking. Um, you just keep asking questions. Why is this so? What, why is this pattern so? What, well, first of all, in the clustering, what is the pattern? And um, uh, there's a, a kind of an organisational um, breakup compared to a thinking breakup in that um, in that clustering. Or if you go back to the male versus female, why is it that more females are expressing enjoyment than males when talking about research, and yet? Um, about the same number are talking about satisfaction, and it's to do with, um, in fact, um, if you if you go exploring, uh, as researchers mature, they talk more about satisfaction and less about just straight enjoyment, and more in the sample, the male researchers tended to be further along the career path than the females, uh, so. You know, you go exploring why why things are the way they are. Okay, uh, so um, again, thinking through this in trials and thinking about causal pathways. One of the uh, um, criticisms of uh, much social research has been that um, it looks only, and trial research in the past, has been that it looks only at outcomes and assumes that a regularity of association means that um, there's a cause and effect relationship. And um, so, yes, there have to be um, some rules about regularity of association that um, uh, B always follows A, um, that uh, B is not present if A isn't present and so on. Those kinds of rules is, um, um, about um, making assumptions from regularity of association. But it's always possible to have it wrong um, because the mechanism isn't, isn't right. Um, I can remember one of the examples that comes to mind is that uh, teenage mothers have low birth weight babies. Um, is it something to do with age? No, it's to do, well, not directly. It's to do with the fact that teenage mothers are more likely to be smokers and um, to have poorer nutrition. Uh, so you know, one has to understand the mechanisms. The link between smoking and lung cancer was really only confirmed when. Um, um, understanding of the carcinogens in cigarette smoke could be linked with the, uh, the actual damage that was being done to the lungs. So uh, understanding causal pathways requires uh, understanding of the mechanisms um, and they will be influenced by context. This is where um, something like uh, developing a grounded theory uh, delves into this kind of issue, or um, if you take uh, um, the critical realist uh, approach uh, emphasises this need to understand mechanisms um, in relation to the context uh, in order to be able to make a, a, any kind of causal claim. Having developed some kind of program theory or logic to direct the research and analysis is fairly much um, essential to be able to achieve this. Um, and I think that, oh yeah, the, uh, the one further thing I wanted to talk about then was having, having taken this mixed methods way of thinking about things, carry it through into the results and the way you write it up. 
Um, and again, I, I recognise that there are constraints imposed by journals, there are constraints imposed particularly in trials um, by um, timing and there are timing issues, there are all kinds of other issues. But in, as far as it's possible, this is what I would say is, is what you should aim for. So what's typically done is that quantitative results will be published separately from qualitative results. And uh, in fact, there have been um, studies by um, Alicia O'Cahoon and others um, that have uh, um, uh, established or shown that this is in fact what happens more often than not, or at least it has in the past. So, and you see it even within an article, uh, commonly um, still, most of the articles I review uh, in, for mixed methods journals still have, here are the quantitative results, here are the qualitative results, and then we'll have a conclusion that pulls them together. Now I would argue that if you've been using mixed methods effectively, that, that you can't divide things in that way, you can't bifurcate the results that way, that the two, the different methods will be speaking to the same topic. And so it makes much more sense to organise your writing around the topics or the subtopics that lead to the overall picture. And so there's a couple of different ways that this might happen. Often you'll start with the more descriptive information and then, then lead into the more theoretical or analytic um, aspect of the results, but both of those will incorporate both qualitative and quantitative information. <clears throat> or maybe, you know, things that you can't define as qualitative or quantitative, like geographic um, or network information. Or you may split the results up according to the subtopics and um, Sometimes these will be more qualitatively oriented or more quantitatively oriented, but each should incorporate some of both, leading to the discussion and conclusions. Or if the uh, study is being written up in a number of different uh, venues, then it might be divided up by subtopic rather than by method. And I would make that plea that you think about it in that way. If what you're doing is simply pulling it together in the conclusion to the study, then that's, that's the kind of study I define as multi-method. You've used multiple methods, but you haven't really integrated them. The integration should be evident in the way the results are presented. And uh, I think uh, at that point, that's where I leave it. Um, I could perhaps do a, a final slide, just as an, an, um, a plug for a book that's coming out later in 2017, in the final, final stages of um, tidying up the manuscript at the moment. So, uh, yeah, now I'll get back off the plug. Uh, maybe there are some questions. Okay, Pat, um, can you hear us okay? Yep, I can hear you. Great. Thank you so much for a fantastic talk, Pat. Um, we have a couple of, we have a bit of time for some questions. Are you, you're happy to take questions? Yep. Okay, fantastic. Um, so I'm just going to see if there's any questions here in the room first. Uh, there's a few on the chat, actually. I just noticed. Um, oh, there's one. Um, the reference for the Straw Men article is um, Max Bergman, and it's in his book, called Advances in Mixed Methods Research, which he edited in 2008. And it's the first chapter in that, which he wrote. That's a sage book. Brilliant. That's fantastic. Thank you, Pat. Um, so just, I'm just going to see if there's, any, there's a number of people here in the room. So I'm just going to see if there's any questions from anyone here first. Yeah, we have a question here. Yes. Hi, Pat. Uh, thanks for your talk. Um, I'm just wondering, when you're analysing, say, both your quantitative and your qualitative data, 
like I've always been taught to remain objective when you're um, when you're analysing. So do you find it difficult to kind of analyse each of those objectively, or do you find that I suppose analysing one um, would that influence your analysis then of the other? I would argue that you can't analyse anything purely objectively. Um, that you will always the, the mere fact that you have to interpret even statistics requires interpretation and uh, your interpretation will be influenced by um, your history your uh, understanding of of um, the topic and so on so I would challenge the notion that you can can remain purely objective you can certainly um, you know, aim to be as you know, as objective as you can, uh, but there will always be um, some interpretation, some influence from from your history and approach and just who you are. Okay, that's, does, that, that's does that answer your question or not? She's, she's nodding. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. There's a couple of other questions there. Um, Pat, can you see them? One from Jonathan Mathers. Can you point to examples of qualitative outcome assessment and trials or mixed methods outcome assessment, please? Um, the, the most obvious thing that comes to mind for qualitative uh, outcome assessment in trials is, is to gain people's experience of whatever it was that happened, um, how they feel about, uh, you know, in terms of the outcome, uh, there are also other other ways. I'm just thinking um, about the work. I'm doing some work at the moment on uh, some activity centres for older women, and you know, if one looks at one can take as an outcome, uh, one of the the issue is it's about well-being and enhancing health and well-being of older women, and outcome measures of well-being. I can I can scale it. I can use the WHO you know well-being scale, or I can use um, you know other kinds of questions. I can also look at um, um, people's enthusiasm for for continuing. I can look at um, the sort of thing that, that one of the uh, coordinators of the centres pointed out to me: uh, people who have changed the way they dress the way they look after themselves, uh, that you know, through coming to the centre uh, someone has um, started to wear makeup, to dress more, more thoughtfully, um, just the whole demeanour of the person has changed. So one can, you know, one can develop uh, those sort of more qualitative ways of assessing things. Um, in terms of, um, oh yeah, okay, you've asked about outcome assessment. So yeah, yeah, it's it's kind of use your imagination a bit. But what would tell me about whatever it is I'm I'm doing, and that I want to achieve? Are there are there things other than numbers? And what's behind the numbers anyway? If I'm measuring something, what's behind that measurement? Um, yeah. Great. Thanks, Pat. Um, I just have a quick question myself as well. Um, so you showed a really nice um, picture of kind of lots of different types of mixed methods. Um, so that nice diagram with the different kind of interlinking methods like longitudinal survey data, um, archive data, that kind of thing. In terms of, I suppose, going about integrating those different, so multiple different types of methods. So I have kind of previously seen a lot where you'd have maybe two types, so as you said, surveys and interviews or um, that type of you know survey and questionnaires or, or questionnaires and interviews and sometimes they happen parallel or sometimes they happen sequentially and kind of inform each other. Um, but if yeah, you have yeah. lots of different ones, say that, that even kind of five different types, how would you, have you any tips maybe on how you'd go about integrating all those different types maybe practically and systematically? Um, it, to me, it goes back to, to um, having worked out the various elements of the topic. You, know, you break your topic down into, into component parts. 
uh, and then you sort your information according to those component parts as a first step. So that's um, that process of either using um, some kind of coding system in qualitative software, or even, as I said, just using Word and using headings in Word. Um, if I go, or you know, if I go back to my PhD study, um, where I had you know at least half a dozen different kinds of information about this this community that I was studying. And this is pre-computer days. So um, in fact, the thesis was written longhand, to give you an idea of how long ago it was. Um, I had a notebook with a, a page for each you know, kind of component part of the topic um, uh, aspect of what was going on in the community. And I was dropping into those pages. I was making notes about the various insights I was getting from the different methods or even you know, potentially you could drop in bits of data. Um, and it starts off as a real mess. Uh, and in fact, in the notebook, you can't do this, but if you're doing that in Word, um, you can use the headings, uh, turn on your document map, and you can use the hyperlink feature to jump straight to where you want to drop an idea. Once you've got all the ideas dropped, um, then you can look at it and see whether you can write it up in a coordinated way. Um, it prompts more questions about why uh, these things, you know, how these things fit together, um, and so on. So, you know, as a first step, it's a it's a sorting coding process to bring the to bring all the different sources together. Great, thank you. It may be. I was just thinking also the sequential thing. Sometimes it is a more sequential process. Mm -hmm. um, and so obviously one method will inform uh, gathering data in another. One of the things that tends to happen is that, particularly where people have used qualitative information to inform survey design, is that they then just write up the survey and completely forget about the qualitative data. And I would argue that you need to also go back and look at that original qualitative data and at the very least, use it to inform the interpretation of the survey responses. Great, thanks. And um, maybe just one final question, if that's okay, Pat, um, from Joanne Callanan. Do you ever find qualitative data don't complement the quantitative results or contradict each other, and how do you deal with that? Yeah. Um, the most common way, um, I've actually got a, um, study in pro an article in process on this particular question of, of dealing with dissonance. And the most common way that people um, deal with it is to find some kind of an explanation. Uh, and it may be, um, most often it's a methodological one or something to do with the way people respond to different methods. And <clears throat> so, um, um, a, a classic example would be a study by um, um, Me Too on um, by uh, looking at people, I think it was, with diabetes, and she had interview data and she had survey, uh, not survey, um, diary data. And in the interview data, some people would talk about doing the right thing um, because they were too embarrassed to say when they did the wrong thing. Um, but in their diary, whether they would actually write what they actually did, and other people would put the right thing, like they uh, followed the right guidelines on food and so on, in the diary. But when you talk to them, you found they hadn't actually done that, and they wrote it in the diary because that was a more permanent record, and um, they wanted the permanent record to look right. Mm. Um, there's, you know, there's all kinds of, of, and so that's a methodological explanation. Um, <clears throat> so often people will come up with these sort of explanations of, of um, uh, to do with audience and, and so on. The other um, thing is to actually use that as a prompt. And in fact, Jennifer Green in particular and Burke Johnson also talk about taking a dialectical approach, deliberately looking for contrast and contradiction as a prompt to new ideas, to developing um, some initiatives about uh, further exploration, about new ways of seeing things. And this leads you into uh, again, what the critical realists call um, and, and pragmatists call abductive, abductive thinking, where you're swinging between 
deductive and inductive approaches, <clears throat> and you're you actually you're thrown something that doesn't fit, and so you have to have come up with an entire new way of thinking about it. Um, and that's actually one of the benefits of of having different data sources, because they will each will challenge the other. Um, at time, well, as often as not, each will challenge the other and force you or cause you to think more deeply. Great, thank you so much, Pat. That was really a fantastic presentation. So we're just going to wrap up there. And um, thank you for everyone for um, attending and for listening and for the excellent questions. So our next webinar is on the 6th of March at 4 p.m. GMT, and it's from Alex Clark from the University of Alberta in Canada. So that should be another fascinating and really enjoyable presentation. And thank you very much again, Pat. Thank you. Okay, take care. Thanks very much. Bye. Thanks. Bye.